Generative AI tools seem to be impacting every industry with countless use cases, but specifically for developers, we've seen a huge acceleration in the pace of development uh, by automating the writing of code. So with the massive volume of newly generated materials entering into the developer's everyday workflow, what new challenges do you see when it comes to managing this abundance of code? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to kind of put it plainly, everything is just going up, right? So, so basically the amount of code that's getting written is going up, the timelines uh, and the amount of features that are shipping, that's going up. The amount of people that are working on a project, that's going up. Uh, everything is just kind of going up and, and converging against a high, vol high velocity and high volume, uh, as you put it, you know, uh, pace, right? And so, you know, what this means for developers is they're trying to keep up with frameworks that are shipping faster, features that users expect faster, um, you know, the code that's that's going on. If you're writing code that's, you know, 50 percent faster than before, then you're doing, you know, PR is 50 percent more. Right. You're doing uh, framework updates 50 percent more. You're just trying to keep up. And so I think that, um, you know, this extreme boost in productivity and output um, is good in one regard, but it also introduces a lot of chaos for the developer, both individuals and teams to just keep up with it. Um, and you don't even have to be writing the code. Imagine you're a product manager and you're like, hey, look, you know, things are moving very fast. You might have missed one important bit of communication. And now you just move very fast in the wrong direction. Right. And so uh, so I think like moving fast is important, uh, but also managing it and, and being aware uh, is is going to be key to uh, kind of maintaining the benefits of that productivity and that velocity. Nice. Yeah, do you yeah. mind if I uh, touch up a little bit on that? Yeah, follow up with uh, Savo here. Yeah, I, I completely agree uh, with what Savo had said here as well. Uh, and, and another thing that I kind of want to hone in on is that one piece that Savo talked about when, uh, you know, if we're moving fast, generating a lot of code, maybe you're new to the language, new to the space, new to a different repository, and you don't know how everything fits together. It may have generated and worked good as uh, it appears to meet the eye, but you may have missed a vital edge case that completely breaks the entire system. Yeah, yeah. And what, one thing that I would mention too is is uh, the education around that code. You know, it's easy to generate things, but how do you understand that code and how do you, you know, organize it and know exactly how it works and, and what it does, you know, inline comments uh, it can be a little bit difficult when you're just generating a high volume of code. So, so yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, generative AI in general. Um, uh, the, you know, it's a huge market that's been exploding in the past couple of years. Uh, and, you know, I think we should talk about where it's at right now and where it's headed into the future. There's been um, some, some huge improvements with ChatGPT, adding custom instructions uh, and a lot of other tools, adding new features every day. So. So Brian, maybe you could walk us through the recent evolution of AI and capabilities that are starting to, to surface that it can uh, impact software development. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think from our standpoint, there've been really two major phases with lar large language models. The first is, I think what everyone's familiar with, it's the, the initial rollout of the large models like ChatGPT and BARD that very simply took input in and pushed an output out. Um, and these exploded in popularity because of the general purpose use of it. There'd never been an AI tool that you didn't have to, or that they even could program to do many, many tasks. This can do almost anything. It could write you a, a love poem and it can write you really nice C++ code. Um, that's incredible. And so that's why it really took off. Um, and we pretty quickly ran up to a wall with this in that everyone's seen the errors or the warnings where you get we don't have info past 2021. Um, we can't access the web, you know, or your code is incorrect without any sources to really cite. How do we fix that? Well, everyone looked to the prompt. You know, before, you, when you wanted to fine tune a model and fix it, you'd retrain the whole model. You get better data on a specific task, you fine tune it. Um, but now the models are too big to do that. And so we looked at these tiny little prompts that we pass in. And there's really two methods there that you can use to improve. The first one, um, and we're using both. The first one is called Retrieval Augmented Generation, RAG. Um, this is when there's simply heuristics to say, okay, it looks like based on your question, um, you need access to another team member for help. It looks like you need access to a website, um, what have you. And we go out, we generate, or we grab data from those sources and we inject it into your prompt. 
and that gets sent to chat GPT as context. Um, and I think Sava will touch on this a bit more about all the different sources of context that we're able to grab in pieces. It's pretty incredible. Um, so that's great. And then the second thing we're doing internally in the ML team is actual prompt tuning. So this is where we're using a small subset of data, uh, code data uh, uh, in this case, and we are tweaking the prompt using a machine learning model to generate better code, um, which is pretty incredible. So we're, and you can use, because of this, you don't have to retrain the entire model. It's a very small subset of weights. So small amounts of data, quick training, quick updates, and the the quality is much, much better. Um, and we And so based on all these kind of prompt tuning methods, we're able to get grounded real information injected in, into, into and supercharge ChatGPT. And uh, that's currently where the space is. People are iterating pretty heavily on this right now. And um, I'm sure there's a next phase coming soon and we are, we're, we're primed to kind of keep riding that wave. So, um, and innovating on that. So we're, we're pretty excited to be in here. Yeah. And, and Brian, I mean, you know, a couple really excellent points there. And I, and I want to add, you know, for the audience that generative AI, um, a lot of developers immediately go to thinking about, hey, it's going to write code. Right. Um, but I think like, you know, we've been working on generative AI, um, like micro models, if you will, or, or task specific models for quite some time, even, you know, well before ChatGPT was out. And they were generating things like tags, titles, descriptions, things like that, where it's not like generative in the idea it's it's outputting entire blocks of code, but it's it's task specific um, regarding what it's actually generating. And so I think like, you know, that's been a big thing for us is how do we generate all the things in addition to the code itself, right? That metadata, metadata, excuse me, that that makes it more searchable or the tags or things like that. Um, and then, yeah, to the, to the note of context, I mean, we'll get into that more, but um, I would say it's not a one size fits all, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's the right tool for the right job. And so we do a lot of traditional machine learning um, and algorithmic processing with graphical embedding spaces and, and um, you know, kind of vector databases and stuff like that to basically uh, allow the AI model to proxy and engage with that stuff, right? And so that's that rapid uh, retrieval augment, uh, augmented generation where you still need that traditional kind of ML infrastructure and database infrastructure to, to squeeze the most juice out of the, the LLM, right? Um, and also clarifying thing for the audience, it's not just ChatGPT. I mean, uh, that is what we started out with, but in our upcoming release, you'll be able to choose from Llama 2 locally, a couple different uh, parameter sizes on that. I'm sure Brian, you'll touch on that. And then also uh, a new variety of cloud models. So Cody from Google, Palm 2, um, uh, GPT 3, 5, and 4. So basically what we're doing is not ChatGPT specific, but it's LLM specific. Uh, and it improves the performance of all the engines that you use. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and just to add a little bit more as well, <clears throat> like as a developer, just using generative AI, um, it's it's such a breeze. We all we all know this. You can generate 85, 90 percent of your code. And then all you have left is just to fill in some of the gaps to connect it to the rest of the system, which enables us to move way, way faster. Tasks that were taking weeks are now taking days, if not hours. Um, but again, just like Sava was talking about, generative AI is is awesome for generating code, but it can also help us with uh, really awesome tasks like understanding what this code does, or how does it fit in the in the, in the grand scheme of things, or what may I uh, may I have missed, or how can I make this more performant X Y Z and so on, um, and I. I think that's that's some of the the real gold nuggets here. Yeah, right. and and the the keyword LLM, the keyword in there for us is language, right? And so you know the other component of generative AI is not necessarily the output, but it's the interpretation of the input. And so you'll see us applying it for you know anything from generating code to figuring out how to set your app to dark mode, right? So you'll have a copilot for your settings that are like, hey, switch to dark mode. And we're able to basically interpret that and then, you know, uh, basically I'll put, you know, a config for JSON that's dark, true, dark, false, whatever it is. So I think that, you know, really what it comes down to is the cleverness and the the kind of um, ensemble, the data ensemble level, you know, um, to to squeeze the most out of the model. They're super flexible. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Atomic personalization. Um, I'm sure anyone coding in a team can empathize with you know, the need to adapt code that you generate to your specific product uh, project. So that's why many people are turning away from 
boilerplate code they find on Stack Overflow and, and trying to generate code with, with AI co-pilots that is, is personalized and, and written a little bit closer to what they need at the end result.